Paige Morehouse. I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Dalhousie and a geriatrician, and I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And this is Samira. <laughs> uh, my name's uh, Melissa Andrew, and I'm a geriatrician and clinician scientist. I live here in Halifax uh, and work at the QE2 and the Geriatric Medicine Research Unit. My name is uh, Arnold Mitnitsky. I'm a researcher. I'm a research professor in Dalhousie University, and I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia. My name is Olga Theu. I live in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and I'm doing research in geriatrics medicine. <laughs> uh, so my name is Dr. Roxanne Sternichuk. I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at Dalhousie University. Catherine Hominick, geriatric social worker. I work and live in Halifax. I'm Fernando Peña. I, I work here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And here currently working as, as let's say, a statistician or data analyst for, for the GMR. My name is Catherine Ann Murray. I'm an occupational therapist on geriatric restorative care. And I live here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Okay. My name is Sultan Darvesh. I'm a neurologist, I'm a chemist and a neuroscientist. Um, I, uh, uh, I live in Halifax and uh, as I say I, I practice uh, neurology and specifically I practice uh, cognitive neurology where I see patients with uh, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. Kenneth Rockwood, Professor of Medicine, Geriatric Medicine and Neurology at Dalhousie University. I'm a physician practice in internal medicine, geriatric medicine, and a big Alzheimer cognitive outpatient practice. Sure, I'm Heather White, and I'm the program manager for Seniors Health and the Rehab and Supportive Care Portfolio here in Health Nova Scotia. So I do primarily clinical research, which means that I look at um, problems that, that patients and their families have in their day-to-day -day, uh, existence with dementia and other diseases, and I try and um, work through ways for people to have a better experience with those diseases. So uh, for example, um, looking at people who are frail and have multiple health problems, um, they have a certain experience of their disease as they navigate through the healthcare system. And, um, a lot of my research seeks to understand how people make healthcare decisions when they're frail um, and how we can help them make better healthcare decisions. Um, most of my work focuses on how um, social environments um, affect older people's health. Uh, so trying to uh, achieve the balance between looking at the intrinsic factors related to their frailty and their medical issues and then um, how their social and physical environments affect your outcomes. Does that make any sense? Sure. I don't think it did. Sure. Uh, my general interest are in um, mathematical modeling of aging uh, as a part of biological process. Uh, I was interested in a long time and uh, dementia is a part of aging. So when we try to understand aging, we cannot avoid uh, dealing with dementia. I'm doing uh, anything about physical activity and frailty. So my major work is to see how we can keep people active so we can uh, stay, live longer and live longer independent. And the focus of my research is to look at early predictors of Alzheimer's disease, uh, specifically uh, changes in behavior that might occur at the preclinical stage of the disease that can help us diagnose the disease at an earlier time point and then guide more appropriate treatment based on those changes. So the issues I've been involved with so far have been um, subacute. So who gets, who comes into hospital, how long do they stay and what kind of label do they get um, by the hospital staff? Uh, um, I'm also interested in when both people have double dementia, so the caregiver and the, um, the patient. And the last interest is in risk aversion. So when people come into hospital from the community and the hospital says that they're not allowed to return, um, except when they have 24-hour care. So these are my interest areas. Right now I'm doing a, a frailty index. 
which is basically trying to ass assess the health status of, if, of people, all people primary. And uh, we, do, we do that by basically counting how many problems have some, uh, uh, people has. And then uh, hopefully we can sort of uh, exactly say what's the, the health status of this person, of this other person, and maybe that in the future can lead to a better assessment of their health care. Okay. Um, I got involved in a small working group this year uh, that's looked at differences in staff perception around risk. Um, and the, the impact that may have on a patient stay in hospital and uh, their involvement in decision making. Um, we're hoping that it'll contribute to a greater body of research around risk in geriatrics and, uh, and start to look at uh, changing our conversations and language we use with patients and families around uh, living at risk in the community. In my, uh, my uh, research uh, is focused on developing uh, uh, drugs for early diagnosis and treatment of uh, neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease. So uh, about half my time is spent with clinical work but half my time is spent doing research. In the research piece I have two arms. One uh, arm studies the problem of frailty in aging and the other one studies the problem of cognitive impairment in aging. And in general I'm interested in complex problems and for most of my career have looked at helping to conceptualize the complex problem and then empirically define the components that make it complex. For the last 15 years we've also looked at the mathematics of complexity, something that underlies both um, the cognitive impairment research program and the frailty research program. Recently, uh, together with uh, one of the nursing unit managers that I co-lead with, we've kind of tried to explore some of the common issues that uh, the team faces and in, in, uh, in looking at how we um, can help facilitate folks in returning to home and uh, in safe discharges. So we've looked around the concepts of risk and, and things, conversations that are of interest to a number of folks on the team and how can we learn from one another and learn from, uh, uh, learn from that inquiry. You know, in terms of a big picture, in many ways in geriatric medicine, we're at the beginning of a new age in the way that we deliver care. And when the discipline was developed, it was developed by Marjorie Warren, who um, was really focused on how to help older people, um, you know, move better and think more clearly and those kinds of things. And uh, and that's appropriate for a lot of older adults. But you know, the more health problems people have, um, the more complex it becomes to do that. And uh, I think that previously in geriatric medicine where we focused a lot on rehabilitation and, and getting people better, we now need to come to terms with the fact that our population is a lot more frail and it's frail because of the things that we've done to them, right? So we treat various diseases and people don't recover completely, they just accumulate more and more problems over time and we need to have models to deal with those patients and right now in our healthcare system we don't have those kinds of models. I'm interested in that because that's going to help individuals, society, families, everybody. So I always wanted to do something in science and research. This is what uh, I was uh, dreaming all the time since I was a kid. I wanted to get involved in research to supplement and improve my practice as a clinician and in turn uh, help develop ways to, uh, new ways to provide, patient, or to provide care to patients and families. And I'm fortunate enough to work in a setting that encourages and supports research initiatives. And I had the opportunity to come up this year. So I think I, I've been a lifelong learner. So everything that inspired my curiosity, I was trying to answer it. Maybe with my, my, my background is more as a physicist. Uh, and then I try to apply, uh, apply math models, models just to try to understand that. But everything interests me. When I finished my organic chemistry PhD, I asked my uh, supervisor, my mentor, you know, once I um, establish my own program, what do you think I should do? And he told me, you know, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but the only advice I can give you is uh, find yourself the most difficult thing that you can, you can think of and start researching that and stick with it. You'll never run out of a job. And so when I went to neuro neurology, which was my interest, I found neurodegenerative disorders such as Alzheimer's disease very, very difficult. 
and uh, and so I started researching that. I started see, seeing patients uh, with Alzheimer's disease, and uh, I don't think I'm going to run out of a job because it's very difficult. Um, well, locally, I did some research looking at um, how people with problems with the, the front part of the brain, the frontal lobe, um, how they do on tests of memory and what tests would be the best one to identify that problem in you know, regular clinical use. So uh, as a result of that, we started using the test that came out on top as part of our routine care and clinic. And so that's kind of exciting to see. And So I was involved with the Alzheimer's Society of Nova Scotia pilot program that we were doing with uh, people with dementia and exercise programs. So there was an exercise program here in uh, Halifax and in Dartmouth that went very well. We got very good feedback. And we're also building how we can continue these programs and have available exercise programs across in the community for people with dementia. So the focus of my research is to understand those early behavioral predictors before any typical characteristics of Alzheimer's disease are present, such as memory loss. And so what I found was that individuals who are healthy initially, both cognitively and functionally, those that experience um, alterations in their sleep-wake cycle, such as sleep disturbances or daytime sleepiness, they're more likely to be at risk for Alzheimer's disease at follow-up. And so understanding these early characteristics can then um, aid us in earlier diagnosis as well as guide more appropriate treatment for those individuals. Last year there was a big movement by the hospital to start to change the labels of patients and they were looking at putting together another unit and we did a research project on the, uh, who the patients were that would be in that unit. They were supposed to have no needs, no care needs, and they actually ended up being really high care needs. So everything was sort of put on hold as a result, I think, of that study. So that felt like action research to me and uh, made a difference. Uh, yeah. The Brain Bank was established and I've been the director of the uh, Brain Bank uh, since 1990. Uh, to uh, 93 when it was uh, established and I think that that has had significant impact in people's awareness particularly those who have been touched by Alzheimer's disease it has had significant impact in that people come to realize that when they donate brain tissues to the brain bank that their lives that have been turned upside down because of this nasty condition that once they donate brain tissues, at least the families feel that that they have actually the life of their loved one was not totally uh, wasted, and that they, in the wake of their death, they continue to teach us. So these are the things that make geriatrics what it is. It's it's it, it's the complex presentation and management of illness, and the work that we try to do for the entire time that I've been aiming to do it is to come up with rational responses to this complex problem which embraces the complexity of older adults and doesn't try and simplify it. Well, you know, research is fundamental. We cannot get new knowledge without research. Uh, Research uh, is in the basis of uh, technological advances and uh, when we have new knowledge, it helps people. Because I will live longer and healthier. I think research keeps us asking each other questions and helps continue to learn. So I think, I, I think the more conversations we have, the more we can challenge one another, um, both against the evidence that we've had or uh, to challenge ourselves to think about things in a new and different way that directly changes then how we can work together with patients and their families. And uh... I think that the people's social circumstances have a much larger impact on their health and their health care than we have previously realized. And what I'm hoping to do is add to our understanding of this and see how we can improve people's health by focusing on their holistic social circumstances. Um, because all of us are going to shuffle off this mortal coil someday and I think that we all want the story of our death to match the story of how we lived. And uh, the research that I'm doing is, is hoping to help align those. At the moment we're doing things that are really expensive and they're 
not producing net benefit and commonly producing net harm, we the medical system. So Canadians should be interested in what our group is doing because we're really fundamentally committed to finding better ways to care for older people who are frail and interestingly these turn out to be commonly less expensive ways. Hard choice, chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Very sweet. Chocolate, definitely. Oh, she's chocolate, that's an easy one. <laughs> uh, chocolate, hands down. Chocolate. <laughs> chocolate. Uh, since I'm a little kid, I always be a chocolate guy. Vanilla. Weird, I know. Vanilla. <laughs> Vanilla. Vanilla. What? <laughs> <laughs>